you're gonna wanna see this. Each of those sand beds represents a storm event. There's a bit of controversy. So we're gonna go ahead and take a walk through time from the bottom to the top of that unit. Wow, hang on, take a look at that. Look what I just found. Welcome to the Rockorama. And if you've clicked on this video, it's because you wanna learn more about what is a shore face. Honestly, there's no better place in the world to look at what a shore face is and how it's preserved in the rock record than right here in the book cliffs of Utah. So that's where I am today. Now, just so we're all talking the same language, let's go ahead and explain what a shore face is. It's the sandy deposit along a shoreline that's affected by storm waves and fair weather waves. And it forms a slope going from offshore to onshore where it meets the coastal dunes and the backshore. The slope of the shore face varies depending on where it is in relation to things like tidal inlets and river mouths, but also the amount of wave action and the depth of the ocean basin at that point. And as you move upslope from the ocean basin, the grain size on the shore face increases from muds and silts offshore to very fine and fine grain sands on the beach. And there's a ton of invertebrate life that lives in and on the shore face. There's everything from worms and shrimp to crabs and bivalves, uh, sea cucumbers and other echinoderms, all sorts of little things that leave really great trace fossils that get preserved in the rock record. And it makes it pretty easy to identify shore faces compared to some other sedimentary environments. Now, most people might be confused about why I'm in the middle of the desert of Utah to look at marine shore face deposits. But that's because back in the Cretaceous, the landscape was a lot different. The Western Interior Seaway had flooded North America and there was an open ocean to the east of where I am right now. That means that a lot of the clastic sediment, meaning just sand and gravel and silt that was washing down from the mountains to the west, was being captured by rivers and transported out to the ocean where it formed deltas. And wave action hitting those deltas reworked the sediment into wave-dominated shorelines or storm-dominated shorelines. And that's where we find shore face deposits. In fact, each of these sandstone benches or ledges that we see in the book cliffs represents an individual shoreline that has prograded to the east from the west. Prograding just means advancing into the sea. So in other words, the shorelines are building out to the east. The opposite of that is retrograding or retreat. So when people talk about sea level rise and shoreline retreat, they're talking about retrogradation in geological terms. And it's important to point out that retrogradation is always associated with a relative rise in sea level, whereas progradation can occur with a relative sea level rise, fall, or if sea level stays the same, because it's associated with sediment supply versus subsidence and sea level. And you know, that's a topic for a completely different discussion and a different video. So let's just go ahead and focus on why we're here right now and watching this video, and it's to learn about shore face deposits. So with that said, let's go ahead and start looking at some rocks. Now, as with most things geological and specifically sedimentary geological, there's a bit of controversy about how exactly we should define a shore face. Some people argue anything that has the characteristic sedimentary structures and successions that I'm about to show you should be called a shore face. Other people point out that those same features occur in a variety of environments like wave dominated deltas, barrier islands, strand plains. So they want to use shore face more strictly in terms of anything disconnected from a deltaic feeder system. In other words, strand planes and features like that. Truth be told, these deposits in the book cliffs are largely connected to fluvial systems and are probably mostly wave dominated deltaic shore faces. Some might be not, some probably are, most probably are. So that's my caveat before we dive into this. The succession of rocks behind me is a shore face deposit in the upper part of the Mesa Verde Clastic Wedge here in the Book Cliffs. And it's got the defining characteristics of shore faces exposed in two dimensions and somewhat three dimensions if we get into all the canyons. So we're gonna go ahead and take a walk through time from the bottom to the top of that unit, see what the facies are, see what the sedimentary structures and trace fossils are, and talk a little bit about what makes a shore face a shore face. So we're walking past a bunch of talus blocks that look hummocky. Um, they're oxidized. They've got anchorite or hematite cement. It's just iron oxide. But here we are at the lowermost part of this shore face succession. Unfortunately, it's covered with a lot of wash, but you can still get the impression that it's fairly heterolithic. It's got sand beds, 
separated by muddier, siltier beds. And each of those sand beds represents a storm event, a tempestite. So in other words, when there was a big hurricane or a big flood on the land, it washed all the sediment out. The sediment got entrained by the water column and redistributed by waves. And that's this. So each of these represents a storm starting down here, working our way up. Incidentally, this is kind of interesting. There's a unique depositional feature. Um, people have called it beef. Where's the beef? But it's a, it's a diagenetic feature that can look a lot like shells. Um, I know serum and bivalve shells have a cross section that looks a lot like this. So sometimes if you find little pieces of it, people think it's a it's an inocerum and bivalve, but it's actually beef. All right, so working our way up, check this out. These surfaces are actually dipping down. They're not horizontal. They're dipping down and then kind of coming back up. Lenticular and wavy bedding. So in other words, they've got a wavy feature to them. They're sort of waving up and down, coming in and out of the plane. They're not perfectly horizontal. So wavy bedding and lenticular bedding are typical of the lower shore face. And from here, in very short order, in about a meter to a meter and a half, we're in some thicker beds. These beds are maybe up to 20 centimeters thick compared to the ones down below, which are more like three to five centimeters thick. So we're seeing an abrupt thickening upward of the beds. And those beds are hummocky to swaley, and there's even some little internal scours visible. Let me just take a minute and backtrack and talk a little bit about what hummocks and swales are. They're sedimentary structures that are generated by the interaction of a storm wave orbital with the sea floor. And because the orbital gets physically smaller as it descends from the surface to the sea floor, the deeper the water, the smaller the orbital, and the smaller the resulting hummock and swale. That means in a typical shore face profile, we can actually gauge where we are relative to lower, middle, and upper shore face by the size of the hummocks. And yes, I should mention that there is disagreement among a lot of sedimentary geologists as to whether we should classify a middle shore face as part of the lower or upper shore face. I just go ahead and call it middle because it's easier, um, but your mileage may vary. So now, continuing on upwards in this deposit, the bed thickness continues to increase, and there's another fairly abrupt change. There are some beautiful, beautiful hummocks and swales in the middle shore face. So bed thickness has changed dramatically up there. It's more like 35, maybe even up to 50, 60 centimeters thick. Look at this profile. We've gone from ratty, heterolithic, wavy, and undulatory bedding to thicker bedded, to thick, clean, hummocky sand. And going even higher up than that, it gets even sandier. So let's walk along a little bit and see what's going on with it. Aha, uh -huh. okay. If you've ever watched my videos, you know I love talus blocks like this because you know you can scramble up there and risk injuring yourself, and frankly, it's a lot of work. Or you can look at the stuff that gravity's brought down for you to examine. You don't always know exactly where it came from, but in a case like this, you at least have a pretty good idea. Look what I just found. This sandstone body is chock full of little ophiomorphas, little bitty guys. And these are ghost shrimp burrows, calianacid shrimp. Things like calianasa or lepidophthalmus, little ghost shrimp, mud shrimp type creatures that live on the coast. These are small. So these are little guys, which are characteristic of stressed environments. Like for example, the modern Trinity Bay head delta. So these little guys live in their burrow their entire life. If they die or the burrow gets abandoned, it gets preserved as is small. So these guys indicate a fairly stressed environment, whereas the next block down has a slightly larger specimen along with some smaller guys. But that's suggesting that the populations here didn't uniformly get large. Some of them stayed very small. So some of them didn't make it to maturity. That's typical in a deltaic system where there's a lot of fresh water coming out, bringing terrestrial material, killing these guys, or simply smothering them in sediment. So a good indication that we're in a stressed environment. This is not a typical shore face, it's a deltaic shore face. Here's some more blocks that came down with a variety of traces, including our friend Ophiomorpha. 
So not a lot of burrows, but what's here indicates marine waters and a stressed environment. Here's that upper succession showing us the nice humpy and swaley bedding. Swales are the synclinal features. Best way to remember synclinal is when you're sinning, you're smiling. And you can see some real nice ones there. These are the lower parts of hummocks that get preserved when accommodation is relatively low or there's a lot of storm activity and truncates the tops of the hummocks. You can really see the nice antiformal shape of the hummocks coming up and forming a, an anticlinal dune. And you can see that scour of the swales. So each of these beds is just chock full of swales and hummocks indicating big wave orbitals coming through. There's also some larger features that almost look like trough cross beds. So, wow, hang on, take a look at that. That is a beautiful hummock right there. Really, really nice. You can see the antiformal shape, just kind of humpback shape in other words. That is an unquestioned hummock going into swaley cross stratification. Wow, okay. Now we're talking. Hummocks and swales put us pretty securely below fair weather wave base and above storm weather wave base. In the western interior of North America, that is anywhere from 15 to 20 meters, give or take. And we know that from full successions of shore faces like this one. So looking at the top, sure enough, we've got about another 15 meters of sediment to get through before at the top of this shore face succession. So we're still in the lower shore face in the hummocky zone. And as we get higher up, you'll see these sand bodies get thicker, more amalgamated towards the top. If the model's accurate, we should see some trough cross bending indicating that unidirectional flow of waves and breakers. A little bit further along, we've got some 3D exposure of some hummocky cross stratification where you can actually see the troughs and then it kind of comes up and forms the antiform, but this is a three-dimensional view. So you can follow them all the way across and you get the sense there's even some rippling in there. Maybe after the initial flow, there was some fair weather wave base modification or something. But that, is the uppermost part of our shore face right in front of us. I'm gonna to try to get as close as I can to it to show you what it looks like. You can already get the sense here, it's fairly massive and it might be hard to see much in it, but we'll do our best. Some more burrows. We've got some surface traces, little grazing trails or trails made by, look at this, a polychaete worm, maybe burrowing through, creating paleophycus. Maybe some vertical ones. Those might be stems of roselia, again, made by burrowing polychaetes, but we're starting to see some increased burrowing activity. Okay, so taking a moment to turn around and take a look where we are, we've worked our way through the lower part of the shore face succession, and we got up to these massive beds, those first massive beds above the heterolithics. And we followed them across, and that's where we still are. You can see some scouring in these beds. So they're not uniform. They definitely indicate a lot of a lot of water activity here on that shore face, that deltaic shore face. So there's that first massive bed, which seems to kind of pinch out here. There's the next one, that second massive bed. So let's get up close and personal to it and see what we see. It's nice and cool in the shade here. This is that massive bed, that second one that we followed from all the way across that way. And lo and behold, it's still hummocky. Still nice, big, low angle hummocks, but they're huge. That's because hummock size increases as you get shallower as a function of the shape and size of that wave orbital, how it's intersecting the sea bottom. So this is exactly what we'd expect in the upper part of a middle shore face where we've got large, long wavelength hummocks with little parting lineations or, or parting episodes like this with this finer grain material representing fair weather. So this is one big storm. This is probably like a Katrina or a Helene or a Beryl depositing a massive amount of sand, reworking it, churning up, creating these massive scale hummocks on the, on the seafloor offshore of the land. And then things got quiet for a while. And that little recessive interval could indicate five years, one year, 10 years, 100 years. We don't really have the time resolution in Cretaceous rocks. But that's an episode where things got quiet. And then there's another massive storm came through. So I'm looking above me, and you're gonna to wanna to see this. Here's the base of the next massive sand above me, and look at all the rip-up clasts. Those are big chunks of siltstone 
mudstone and possibly sandstone that have been ripped up and reworked and spewed out. Now they might be coming from tidal flats on the shore. They might be coming from a river mouth. Remember, these are river dominated um, shore faces, or they might just be getting reworked from material like this that's getting ripped up during a storm. But they indicate there was some cohesion to the finer grain materials, the muds and the silts, enough that they were able to round in the currents, not just getting ripped up and dumped. They were able to kind of work their way around, get washed back and forth, get rounded, and then came to rest at the base of another storm event. That's typical of hummocky beds where you see rip up class, but these are really big, consistent with being close to the shoreline. So we've moved progressively closer to shoreline through this succession. So now we're in that second major bench, the big, the first of the really thick ones, and we've got massive hummocky stratification. Then there's a recessive interval again, and yet another massive hummocky bedded interval. But on top of that, things get ratty. And that rattiness is part of a regional erosional surface that puts deltaic distributary channel deposits in the shore face. And that is a topic for another video. So unfortunately for us, this outcrop does not preserve a complete shore face succession. And in fact, out here in the Book Cliffs, it's really rare to find a complete succession with the upper shore face and the foreshore because they're either incised by a river channel like this one, or they're capped by a transgressive surface that resulted from a relative rise in sea level as the sediment compacted and subsidence took the entire succession below sea level, just like is happening in New Orleans with the Mississippi Delta subsiding and compacting and getting occasionally flooded. Still, there are examples of complete shore face successions out here if you know where to look. One of them is right here in the Aberdeen member just west of the little town of Helper, where you can actually see an upper shore face, foreshore, and even backshore deposits. If you go back and look at the comments on my last video, there's a really good question that somebody asked, and it's essentially, who cares? You know, we get into all this gory detail about the geology and the interpretation, but is there any real value to this? Any monetary value, or is it just academic? And in fact, there's a lot of value to most of the geological questions and topics I discuss on this channel, and that's because the oil industry, the gas industry, geothermal industry, carbon sequestration industry, we can lump them all together as the energy industry in general, is very interested in how do you characterize these bodies in subsurface. Think about how much it costs to drill a well. Tens of millions, a hundred million dollars in deep water. You don't want to waste money drilling something and then find out it's not as big as you thought it was, or it's not as aerially distributed, or it's got the wrong type of rock. So you really want to understand how to predict from a few subsurface data points what you're likely to encounter when you sink your $100 million well. That's where outcrops like this come in. And that's where outcrop geologists like me come in, because we can study the outcrop and the available modern analogs and then make a prediction, an informed prediction, based on calibrated observations, based on measurements, so you're not just drilling blind and hoping for the best. I mean, we're not Jed Clampett here. You're hoping for a little bit better if you're going to sink $100 million into the ground. So that's why the oil companies have been spending so much money and time studying rocks just like this. In fact, they come to this very outcrop all the time to instruct their geomodelers, engineers, and drillers about what to expect in the subsurface. Bet you didn't know that. Okay, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed our little tour of a Cretaceous Deltaic shore face and our discussion about what shore faces are in the modern world and the ancient, how to recognize them. You know, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and subscribe. There's plenty more coming. And as always, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you on the outcrop. Take it easy.